just a month ago, when thumbing through the pages of the Federal Register, an affected member of the regulated community would have noticed that OSHA had published a proposed revision to the Hazard Communication Standard, or otherwise known as HASCOM or HCS, and has called for comments to be filed by April 19th. We'll talk about this on today's episode of the OSHA 3030 with Manish Rath. Hello, everyone. I'm Manish Rath. Welcome to the OSHA 3030 with Manish Rath. We've got a great topic today. OSHA has published a significant new rulemaking initiative. They have proposed revisions to the hazard communication standard. Uh, this is a program, the OSHA 3030, as many of you know, that we've been doing for eight years. Uh, and we are in our eighth year. We've been doing it since about 2014. And uh, about somewhere around our 90th episode, uh, this is a program that we are now doing through Zoom. And you can catch both the video, the slides, as well as the audio all through logging in on Zoom. Uh, we also do this as a, uh, we rebroadcast re it as a podcast. So anyone who ever misses any old episodes, you can catch them all as a podcast. Uh, as I said before, I'm Manish Rath, and I'm an attorney at the law firm Keller and Heckman here in Washington, DC. And I've been practicing OSHA law for, well, over 20 of my 25, 26 years of practice. And this is a, a interesting development today's su subject as a consequence. And so I'm fortunate to be joined by one of the most well-known and accomplished OSHA attorneys anywhere in the nation in federal OSHA states or in state plan states, uh, and somebody who studies the issues involving the hazard communication standard on a daily basis, my friend and partner at Keller and Heckman, Larry Halpern. Larry, thank you very much for joining us today. Hello, Manish. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, Larry, uh, as you know, we've been doing this for a while, and all of our episodes of the OSHA 3030 are libraried on our website at khlaw.com slash OSHA3030. And you can check out any of our about 90 episodes there. Most of them are still highly educational, highly informative. Uh, and as well, uh, several years ago, we started republishing this as a podcast. So it's important for all of y'all listening that if you've missed episodes, catch them on your favorite podcast uh, app. And to also share the good word. Remember, we put this program on every month uh, about a, a new topic in about 30 minutes. And uh, we, we do this complimentary to the clients and friends of Keller and Hackman, so that you stay up to date on the latest developments in OSHA law. And all we ask in exchange is that when you get the invitation for the next episode of the OSHA 3030, please forward it on to three other people at least, in-house counsel, safety and health professionals. If you've already done so, thank you. But please forward it on to three more people within your organization or to organizations down the street in your community. Uh, the more people who know about the program, uh, new members are the lifeblood of keeping the program going. So, and we want to keep it going. So please, please take time to forward the invitation on to others within and without your organization who are responsible for compliance with OSHA laws and, and staying up to date with OSHA developments. So Larry, why don't we talk about what we're going to talk about today? Uh, the proposed rule to revise the HASCOM standard. Uh, first, we'll talk about the proposal and why OSHA has decided to revise the standard why we're looking at perhaps the third version in, in about 10 years, uh, and, and some of the substantive changes to the scope of, of hazard classification, which I think is probably the big subject today. Uh, they've, they've incorporated some proposed revisions for trade secret protection uh, with respect to the information that, that uh, affected stakeholders will have to put on their safety data sheets. And we'll talk about uh, some, some proposed revisions to arrange for more flexible uh, solutions for shipping for small containers or for bulk shipments. Uh, we'll talk about the economic impact and the compliance deadlines for this proposed rule, uh, as well as the comment deadlines. And finally, as we always do, some takeaway items that folks can walk away with uh, in the last segment called What Employers Should Do. We've added a new segment, Larry, as you know, for today for the first time, uh, we've, we've got a new segment. After we turn off the recording for the podcast, after we turn off the recording for Zoom, we'll go completely off the record and take a few questions that were pre-submitted. Those who registered, we notify them that they can submit questions. And we're just gonna have an off the record exchange. So for future episodes, if you get an invitation, 
uh, think about what questions you might have. They may relate to this topic of the month or may relate to anything related to occupational safety and health that you, you might want some help with uh, from an OSHA attorney. And we will select two or three questions each month for an off the record discussion after we turn off the recording for, for our podcast and for Zoom and for, for our website. So that's gonna be the last section that we'll cover. So Larry, let me, let me just set the stage real quick on this standard. On February 16th, OSHA proposed a notice of proposed rulemaking, issued, published a notice of proposed rulemaking for the HASCOM standard in the Federal Register. And the, and the idea was that the last time the standard, the, the standard was published for the first time in 1983. And that was about 13 years in to the 50 year history, 51 year history of OSHA. And so, so for the majority of the time that the OSHA Act has, has been enacted, the HASCOM standard has been in place. And it's been revised and most recently in 2012. In fact, about this time of year, around March uh, 26th, if I'm not mistaken, on, in, in 2012, uh, OSHA published the most recent and the current version of the HASCOM standard. And they did so in order to align certain elements of the standard with the system in place in Europe, in the EU system, as well as adopted by the United Nations, the, what's called the Globally Harmonized System, or GHS, uh, for classification of hazardous chemicals. And at that point, has GHS was on, on version number three. It had already been around and had been revised a couple of times. So it was on, on GHS version three. So OSHA had uh, revised the HASCOM standards to align certain elements with that, and that was 2012. In the intervening nine years, GHS has been revised several times. It's now on GHS version eight. seven. And so- Just to be clarified, they're already up to eight. Okay, but uh, Canada's on seven. So we're, we're harmonizing with Canada. Yeah, thank you. So, so what they're doing is they're essentially harmonizing with GHS revision seven, but you're, you're right. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Uh, so, so with that said, uh, the, the agency felt like it was high time to update the standard. And as well, there were some discrepancies between some of the requirements uh, in the OSHA HASCOM standard and the Department of Transportation's placarding requirements, uh, et cetera. And as well, Canada, as you point out, Larry, uh, is now aligned with GHS revision seven and its uh, analog agency, WEMIS, uh, has, has some variations that OSHA wanted to harmonize with. So, so that's the, the basis for this proposed change. Larry, why don't we talk about what I think is maybe the biggest change, which is uh, which proposed change, which will affect how employers classify hazards. Sure. So when everybody leaves today, I would like you to leave with the idea that there are some harmonization changes that are relatively less significant than the potentially enormous changes in the implementation provisions that go far beyond harmonization. And if you think this rule is just about harmonization, you're severely being misled by whatever you've heard or read. Uh, basically, as you know, OSHA has taken the position that a manufacturer is responsible to some unclear extent for anticipating normal conditions of downstream use and covering them in the hazard assessment. So what I personally believe is the agency is improperly conflating two ideas. One is the scope of the standard, which is every chemical which is in the workplace so that someone would be exposed under normal conditions of use. And the other question is what is somebody's obligation as a manufacturer responsible for classification. The classification obligation is based on the chemical produced in your workplace, not the chemical that gets produced downstream by the user. That's the explicit language of the standard, produced in your workplace. So in my opinion, OSHA is distorting the standard and trying to conflate the two ideas. And with respect to saying that manufacturer of chemicals responsible for anticipating and addressing hazard classification based on changes in form, that's a little easier to swallow and understand. We're saying basically the chemicals got the same CAS number or chemical structure for the most part. Uh, it's just a different state, a different particle size where it goes from 
non-respirable to respirable or non-combustible to combustible, uh, or maybe something's encapsulated and the encapsulation is removed. Uh, so you can see to some extent, the upstream manufacturer who let's say produces an eight by four sheet of plywood, well that plywood got cut. So it generated the, uh, the wood dust. So when you create a safety data sheet for your own workers, it's also gonna cover the downstream employer who then further cuts the, the plywood, or the two by four or whatever. So that's, that one's easier to understand. Um, you would certainly, I think, object if OSHA said that the manufacturer of a chemical was responsible for preparing a hazard classification based on every chemical that your chemical might mix with downstream. You, I think we'd all agree that's totally absurd. But and I'll turn it over to Monish in just a second. When you look at hazard classifications that have to be based on any downstream reaction under normal conditions of use, that's exactly what happens. Because if you take your chemical and mix it with something, and OSHA says, well, you don't have to worry about classifying for that. But then that mixture gets reacted downstream. Now, the way this language is actually written, you're on the hook for anticipating that and classifying your chemical to take into account the fact that it's first mixed and then reacted downstream. So if we could advance to the, to the next slide and talk about an example. Go ahead, Manj. Get in the next slide. Okay. If you like, this is a very simple example. Imagine a common sense. Manufacturer A manufactures and sells chemical one. Manufacturer B manufactures and sells chemical two. Manufacturer C basically takes chemical one, two and combines them in a chemical reaction. Okay. So logically, you would think manufacturer A would do the hazard classification for one, manufacturer B do the classification for two, and manufacturer C would do the classification for chemical three. And in the reaction, there's also a byproduct. So you expect manufacturer C to cover the byproduct. And then technically, nobody would be covering the heat of the reaction and things like that. Uh, that would be, well, manufacturer C would be responsible for anticipating that because it conducted the reaction. So you'd expect it to do the assessment of what that reaction might produce and look at the PPE standard in terms of what protective measures would be or use the general duty clause and decide what kind of containers and vessels would need to be used to properly conduct that reaction. You wouldn't expect manufacturer A to do that or manufacturer B. But what this proposal says, as it's written, literally, that manufacturer A would say, okay, manufacturer C is going to conduct this reaction. Therefore, it's a normal condition of use. Therefore, I'm now responsible for doing a hazard classification for my chemical one for this chemical reaction that chem the manufacturer C is gonna carry out. So I'm responsible for not only my chemical, but I'm responsible for chemical three, the byproduct one and the significant heat. And the same thing is applies to manufacturer B. They'd re be responsible for all this downstream activity. And of course you can imagine if chemical one was actually a mixture supplied by three different manufacturers and, and chemical two is also some sort of a mixture, then you'd have six other parties potentially involved, all responsible for doing the hazard classification for the reaction downstream conducted by manufacturer C. I think we all would agree that is absurd, outrageous, whatever word you wanna use. You know, that may be not OSHA's intent, but that's the way it's written. And you know, just to drop down to the last point, and then we can go back to some of these other things is if OSHA creates a liability or responsibility for that kind of an analysis and it's not done, you can imagine the tort consequences. And in order to try to perform this responsibility as OSHA's described it, you can see that it would be basically infeasible to anticipate every downstream combination that resulting in a reaction of your produced chemical with somebody else's or some combination of somebody else's. But that is what OSHA has proposed.
And well, there's no that, way around that it. That is a very broad uh, expectation for the upstream manufacturer or importer. Uh, but it's not just uh, the, the example you gave of two manufacturers propose, uh, manufacturing a substance and selling them to a, a another manufacturer who will combine them to create a chemical reaction is not just uh, the, the, the proposed standard doesn't just apply to examples like that, where it is the normal use for that third manufacturer to, to create intentionally and regularly a chemical reaction. The proposed standard would also include any reasonably foreseeable unintended chemical reactions or any reasonably foreseeable emergency uh, resulting from chemical reactions. And that, that expects quite a lot. That may not be as huge a burden for a manufacturer that makes a highly specific specialized chemical, but if you were to talk about uh, certain chemicals that have incredibly versatile applicability, solvents, for example, uh, the polymerization reactions are essentially exothermic. Uh, they, these are the kinds of reactions where there are thousands and thousands and thousands of combinations being uh, used in the marketplace and constantly being innovated regularly by downstream customers in ways that the original manufacturers of the original substances couldn't, I, I don't think reasonably be expected to, to be able to forecast. And I think that's, that's going to be really troublesome for so, the upstream substance manufacturer. So you end up with is a ridiculous situation of multiple parties responsible for doing the same classification not even coming out with the same result, depending on what their chemical they're supplying. Um, if you can try to anticipate every reaction in which something might be involved, you potentially could find yourself posing a, virtually every one of the classifications and hazards that's listed in the entire regulatory scheme, uh, which would be absurd. The downstream user would have no ability to sort through all that and decide what was really relevant to them unless somebody took the trouble to say, well, if you use the chemical this way with these particular combinations, this is the result you get. Nobody's going to take on that responsibility. So you end up with a useless document, which results in huge number of classifications, which would diverge from the harmonization of the GHS ridiculously. Uh, and to create potential tort liability, confuse workers, make the system dysfunctional. And I, I can't say that's what OSHA intended, but that's what they wrote. And the examples they give are not supportive in my mind. They give the example of somebody, probably all bought these cartridges with a component A and a component B and you mix them together and you get a form of epoxy resin. Well, the upstream manufacturer in that case selected the chemicals, designed the ratio in which they'd be introduced, put them in the actual process vessel, if you want to call it, that they're going to be delivered from. That's a unique kind of a kit situation. That doesn't justify a broad provision like this. Similarly, OSHA mentions the uh, idea that concrete, ready mixed concrete is going to be mixed with water. Well, that's the only way it's going to be used. So giving that as an example versus something like the solvent you mentioned that could be used in thousands or tens of thousands of different reactions does not support this kind of broad use language. And no, similarly, I, you know, and the I same thing with repeat the, something you already said, because it bears repeating. I predict that in order to solve for this problem, many manufacturers are going to find that it is reasonably foreseeable that a reaction will result in any one of the cl hazard classifications. And so some of them will put all of the hazard classifications down, some justifiably so. And by doing so, they're going to be putting remote risks all shoulder to shoulder with real and present risks associated with the specific chemical they're manufacturing and thus diluting the significance of that really immediately relevant data. Uh, and which you refer to as rendering the whole document less meaningful less informative by, by requiring the manufacturer to put too much information in. And I think it's that's a recipe real, for failure. For I think that's system. right. And I think that is, that is the likely outcome, the unintended consequence that is likely to ensue if this requirement stays as written. And the, of course, the cost of attempting to evaluate all these particular scenarios would be absurd 
and uh, never something that could, anybody could get done in a year. Right, the timing as well is unreasonable, I think, uh, given, given the scope of this requirement. Let's keep, in the interest of our timeline, let's keep moving to trade secrets uh, claims on safety data sheets. So traditionally, uh, the practice, widespread practice has been, and, and just permitted by the current uh, version of the HASCOM standard, that, an, that a manufacturer can claim uh, that the concentration of a specific ingredient is a trade secret. That is the secret recipe. And so they will, in lieu of a specific concentration in a mixture, will identify a concentration range. Uh, I apologize, that, that they would identify that the concentration itself is a trade secret. And in the proposed rule, permits the use of specified ranges. There's 13 specific ranges that they've identified. I'll put them up, uh, ranging from uh, a tenth of a percent to one full percent, all the way up to 80 to 100%. None of them ranging more than about 30% uh, ranges. And you have to pick from one of these 13 range categories uh, and, and identify one of them as the concentration range if you're claiming a trade secret. So, so, and beside, besides that requirement that you have to pick from one of those 13, you have to pick the one that is the narrowest applicable range to your particular formulation. Uh, this is a feature of the proposed rule that OSHA has put in that would conform to the current version uh, published by Wemis for Canada. And it, uh, I, I believe, is, it is offered with the intention of trying to create some flexibility to protect trade secrets for concentration levels without allowing employers on, or manufacturers, on the other hand, to uh, create a wildly wide range that's not informative. There's Manish, one other... just to clarify, I just want to clarify Clarity, one thing. Um, now, like, as you noted, you simply say trade secret and don't list any concentration at all. Even if you have a specific concentration under the current system when you would just totally exclude it under the new system, you would have to specify the range in which that falls. And the question for many organizations would be whether that adequately protects the trade secret or whether that gives too much away. And if you've got that concern, definitely need to file some comments. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Larry. I think that that question is one that OSHA has presumed and would benefit from hearing from the stakeholder community. There's one exception to this exception, and that is if uh, a healthcare provider uh, has a need for some, some information that's, that's more specific than disclosed on the safety data sheet uh, for treatment purposes. Uh, and I think that, uh, Larry, your point on this slide is well taken that, that in order to assert a trade secret in other spheres, it's, imp it's imperative that a manufacturer demonstrate the means or measures by way that they've taken by which to protect that that trade secret and disclosure of the uh, information that was otherwise pre previously protected in prior safety data sheets uh, to healthcare professionals it's an open question as to how to co how courts may interpret that activity with respect to that elemental requirement for asserting a trade secret in other spheres so in this particular proposal what OSHA is really doing is expanding the group of individuals to which the disclosure would have to be made from just a treating physician and a nurse, for example, in the emergency to everybody who falls into that category of physician or other licensed healthcare professional. Uh, and you know, it, it seems logical to think that the broader you make that group, the more likely you're gonna to have to deal with the possibility that somebody's not gonna maintain the trade secret or in worst case that they're um, making a false statement about whether there's really a need for it. Right, it's essentially then... a broadening of the existing provision for healthcare providers with a need to know to healthcare providers more broadly than just those who have mm -hmm. an immediate need to know. And I think that that, that does uh, raise the question as to how to protect the trade secret in that environment. Yes. So let's move on to shipments of products. Uh, the first thing I think we should talk about is labeling. Uh, under the proposed rule, the OSHA has proposed for the, the proposed revised HASCOM standard that labels for bulk shipments 
need not be placed on the immediate container for the hazardous material. They may, but they may also be transmitted on the outside of an outside container, a tote, for example, or transmitted along with other, with the shipment, for example, along with shipping papers or bills of lading. And they may also be provided electronically so that the recipient can, can immediately print the label upon receipt of the shipment. Uh, there, and there's another provision in the proposed rule that if a bulk shipment is placed in a shipping container, for example, a rail car or a trailer for, uh, for a tractor trailer or intermodal container, that the, the, that container would constitute the immediate container that could be labeled. Uh, I think that there is an opportunity for OSHA in the final rule to clarify how they would treat palletized items uh, and whether or not that constitutes the bulk shipment under this proposed bulk shipment provision. And, and there's also, well, there has always been some discrepancy with DOT guidance for the DOT placard and OSHA, and there's been some discrepancies in which uh, types of classes of materials require a pictogram and which ones do not. And so the proposed rule attempts to harmonize some, but I, I do note that uh, folks are, uh, that I've been speaking with at the manufacturing sites have noted that it doesn't harmonize all of the discrepancies between current DOT guidance and, and the proposed rule, uh, but it does attempt to, to harmonize some of those. So just to, to clarify, make sure we're clear on this, this proposal would apply if, if you have a bulk shipment, which means you have to have the shipment with an immediate container being something like a tanker truck or a rail car. Uh, the question, for example, would be is if you have some palletized items sitting in otherwise, not otherwise contained, but sitting in this tanker, excuse me, in this rail car, not a tanker, um, whether the pallets themselves are considered containers so that the exception doesn't apply. And there's an interpretation from OSHA that basically says strapped bricks on a pallet would be considered a container. I have no idea what the container would be. Uh, but, Straps presumably, but I see your point. So if you know if you take that attitude, they might take this the position that shrink wrap would have the same effect. So this is another one of those provisions that need some comment so that you don't end up finding out that your palletized items don't qualify for this because they're shrink wrapped or strapped. Right. I think that the plain reading of the bulk shipment requirement is that the product goes immediately into the shipping container like a rail car mm -hmm. uh, and that if it's otherwise packaged and then placed into the, sh the shipping container like a rail car that the bulk shipment provision for the rail car labeling would not apply. But I think you're right that it's not clearly spelled out what would happen if there's any kind of packaging around a group of product items uh, then that are then placed into a transportation mode of transportation container like a taker truck or a, a rail car. So if you uh, don't qualify for this, then you have to fall back on the solid items of, of metal, wood, and, and plastic items or or whole grain, those the and the other, other exceptions, which would give you this kind of relief at right. the present time. Right, good point. Okay, so speaking of labels, there is a provision in this proposed rule for chemicals released for shipment. The way I see it, it, it is essentially a, an enforcement mechanism, but I, I think that it does have implications well beyond that. And the difficulty that it creates in its current draft uh, is, it needs to be addressed before it goes final. The, the proposed rule states that labels must be revised within six, day, uh, six months of the, the uh, dates in which, I'm sorry, this is the, the proposed rule has, all, has since 2012, this is a, a 2012 uh, require, uh, provision that, that when, an employer or a manufacturer or an importer becomes newly aware of significant hazard information that's either pre-existing or newly developed, then it has six months to revise its labels. Labels that are in the stream of commerce under the 2012 paradigm, manufacturers or importers, even distributors would have to uh, revise that product within six months. The proposed rule 
I, I believe in an attempt to address some of the difficulties presented by that, uh, that current paradigm. Uh, the in the proposed rule, OSHA is proposing that chemicals that have already been released for shipment and are awaiting uh, further distribution do not require relabeling. You do not need to follow it through the stream of uh, commerce and relabel. That there would be an exemption from relabeling a particular product item if it has already been released for shipment. And that product that has been released for shipment after a requirement, for example, the new hazard classification uh, under the new proposed rule would, would have to be relabeled. But if it's been released for shipment prior to the, to the implementation of the requirement for a manufacturer, importer, distributor, or uh, other employer, then, then they would not need to relabel that particular item. So I think OSHA was trying to offer a provision that made the physical problems of relabeling existing products uh, more manageable. The problem is that it only applies to products where the label itself has a released for shipment date. And when I have been speaking over the past month to manufacturers, they've all uniformly said to me that the released for shipment date or the equivalent dating system, batch date, is not on their label. And the idea that OSHA uh, will provide an exemption if the label has a released for shipment date uh, really doesn't solve any problem because those products that are released, already released for shipment already have labels and they don't have a release for shipment date on them. Uh, so I think that that has to be addressed uh, during this rulemaking process. Larry, what are your thoughts on the, any other thoughts on the released for shipment provision? I mean, it's a big help because before you'd have to say, okay, how many products, how, how many, what, you know, what number of this product can I make between now and the six month deadline so that I don't run out of product and so they don't have excess product that I theoretically have to relabel. And this gets rid of that problem. For people who pre-print labels or pre-print bags, this is not the solution to their problem because you don't have something released for shipment when you've got a pre-printed label or pre-printed bag. But it, certainly it's a step in the right direction um, and it reflects reality. And, and your point's excellent about the date issue. It's not really clear whether you just get cited for not putting the date on there or whether OSHA would go have to go to the trouble of showing that you didn't really have that product released for shipment when you said you did. Um, part of this is supposed to deal with product that's actually shipped out into the market, returned possibly years later, and then reshipped out again. That's happened in the agricultural sector. So clearly none of those people could have a release for shipment date on the product that's already out in the marketplace and could be out in the marketplace for years before it comes back and then turned around and shipped out to somebody else. So you make an excellent point. Moving a little quicker, small packages, small containers uh, that you, you've seen, uh, maybe your, your organization produces these. They're so small that the information on the label won't fit. And so you have these stickers or labels that fold out or uh, larger packaging than is necessary in order, just in order to comply with the labeling requirements. Uh, so OSHA has attempted to address that in the proposed rule by allowing containers that are small, too small for that information to contain only the product identifier, the pictogram and signal word, and then the name of the manufacturer and phone number. Uh, and that other packaging uh, or for the case, for example, of, of product items can have the full label information. Uh, I think that that is a significant step in the right direction. And I think that there has been uh, a great deal of difficulty in the manufacturing community to try and fit all information required on ultra small packaging. Uh, so I, I applaud that. Uh, and again, Remember, in the interest of, of keeping, trying to keep us somewhat on time, I'll move forward to the next right. point. Just keep in mind that could be kits with not always having one chemical in there. There could be multiple different chemicals in there. Then you have multiple labels on the outside. The mm -hmm. proposal isn't clear whether if you have a fully labeled container, because it's not a small one that's inside the kit, whether that's going to end up with a label on the outside, whether that one's not going to be, so you have an incomplete set of labels on the outer package. Uh, well, that's a great point, Larry, and that, that's something that probably should be addressed during the rulemaking. 
by somebody who's affected by that kind of uh, product line. So in addition, they've re revised the categories for hazards uh, and precautionary statements, uh, aerosols, for example, um, and, and flammable gases. Uh, pyrophoric has been eliminated. Uh, well, it's been tucked in uh, and there are new definitions. There's a lot of new definitions that really impact how the rest of the standard applies. I'll point out a few, the definitions for skin corrosion or irritation, serious eye damage versus eye irritation uh, and germ cell mutagenicity. Uh, these are these are some significant definitional changes, and there are a lot of other definition changes that I encourage folk not to, if they're going to comment, don't just go straight to the requirements, look at all of the definitions and see whether those are clear, and look at the words that haven't been defined but are used throughout the standard, and uh, ask yourself whether you feel like they're sufficiently clear. If not, those need to be addressed in any comments that you're preparing. Uh, okay, combustible dust, add, Larry, can I just add one thing? Yeah, the precautionary statements for every physical hazard is significantly revised. So everybody who's got one of those products with physical hazards is going to have to revise the data sheet and the label. And every single hazardous chemical, there's a precautionary statement that deals with disposal. And the revised language says you not only have to talk about disposal, you have to talk about whether it's disposal of the container, the contents, or both, which means every single safety data sheet and label in the United States is going to have to be revised. Right. Thank you. Uh, Larry, let's talk about combustible dust. That is something that we've, we've mm -hmm. addressed in safety data sheets for years. Now they've proposed a definition for combustible dust. Uh, to include finely divided solid particles that are likely to catch fire or explode uh, on ignition when dispersed in air or other oxidizing media. Uh, that definition uh, is certainly more helpful than the absence of a definition, but I think it presents other problems. Yeah, I think the, <laughs> the definition that, that was in NFPA standards or in the field directive, uh, the NEP for, for combustible dust was much better. This one's ambiguous whether fire is related to ignition or the ignition wording only applies to explosions. Uh, but it also says on ignition, where the typical standard would say whether it's liable to catch fire or explode in the environment which it's present or something more to that effect. So what you have here, it seems to be a, there's gonna be a presumption of ignition and what happens afterward. Whereas the standard testing uses a specific energy level. And if you don't get ignition from that energy level, you don't have a combustible dust. Uh, on ignition here, I would assume means that you could use any energy source potentially would be available, which would be a lightning bolt. And you can get a lot more energy out of that than anything anybody's gonna test on. It's a serious so, problem. You over classify and do that kind of an analysis. So in every rulemaking, the agency has to take into account the economic impact of its proposed rule. Uh, that is also true here. Uh, and I think it's important to, for the stakeholder community to prepare comments that provide information to the agency as to the economic impact. After all, uh, the agency has, has asserted that the proposed rule will not only not cost manufacturers, importers, and distributors, but will save substantially uh, a substantial amount of money for manufacturers, distributors, importers. And I think that it's important for the affected stakeholders to educate the agency on the actual economic impact, uh, including most importantly, and I started off at the beginning of this program saying, I think this is gonna be the most important provision, the cost of going back to every single product item and reevaluating what are the hazard classifications in light of the new requirements that you also contemplate uh, hazards associated with a chemical reaction that's reasonably foreseeable. Uh, that, that I think is a process, especially, especially for manufacturers who have hundreds or thousands of product items that is time consuming, labor intensive, and therefore very costly. Uh, then once you've done that, the cost of revising all safety data sheets, the cost of uh, revising all labels. And, and as you know, there's a significant component of the standard that goes to training. Uh, it's essentially a standard about labels, safety data sheets, inventory, and training. And the training uh, costs necessitated by the proposed rule, I think are gonna be considerable as well. Uh, of course, there may be some cost savings relating to these shipment provisions that we talked about, Larry, you and I, but I think that they may be 
smaller than, than OSHA has estimated. And in, in fact, I think when it comes to, for example, the labels, that they may actually be a substantial cost increase as labeling has to change and you have to, to make sure that the, the new information is tracked uh, for products that haven't yet been released for shipment. So, so, the, so substantial just, just clarify, cost implications that need to be addressed. Larry, yeah, please. I'm sorry to clarify. So OSHA says it's going to cost, it's going to save everybody $27 million a year. And the savings are based largely on the um, small container labeling, release for shipment, um, which are basically things that were infeasible to comply with in the first place, which OSHA conceded, which is why they're making the changes. So if things were infeasible to comply with, which in my mind, based on my knowledge, they weren't complied with. We're not saving any money for things we weren't doing in the first place. So when you turn around and look at what the cost could be for the chemical reaction classification issue, I'm guessing it's gonna cost $100 million a year instead of saving. 27 million dollars a year at least. that's a practical reality that you've identified that may not uh, be as persuasive when put in print but i think that practically speaking it's an incredibly important point okay so let's talk about the compliance deadline since larry you and i've been talking about the kinds of things that that listeners to the osha 3030 could include in their comments uh we should point out that the comments are due april 19th uh, after that, once the rulemaking is completed, OSHA is proposing that compliance begins with uh, manufacturers, importers, or distributors to uh, have completed their evaluations within one year from the effective date of the final rule for substances and from mixtures two years from the effective date of the final rule. They, they don't define uh, evaluating uh, and what, what steps have to have been accomplished by that one year or two year date. Uh, within the uh, the phrase evaluating, but I, I do know that that at a minimum would include the expectation, at least now as currently proposed, to to have labeling and safety data sheets uh, for those substances that that do necessitate changes, which um, I can't imagine uh, yeah. many that will not require any changes. Larry, your thoughts on that so far? Yeah. So my just to get clear on this evaluating. The word evaluating is used in the hazard determination section in right. 1910, 1200D. So if OSHA is really saying that if you are actually have to reclassify, then you have a year or two. That means anybody who is not reclassifying has to come into compliance within 60 days of whatever is currently required. And, and, and we're talking about a revised label and data sheet. Right. So it's really important that we know what evaluating means and whether it means in theory that you're a manufacturer and you could be evaluating or that you actually have something to evaluate and you're actually going to reclassify and you won't know that until you go about doing it. You won't be able to do that until you know what chemical reaction downstream assessment is supposed to be performed, if any, or whether OSHA is going to completely change that concept. So right. basically, I apologize for saying you have absolutely no idea what your time frame is because you don't know what your requirements are because they're so poorly written at this point in time. Yeah, and, and one of the so, problems I have with this, Larry, is that when we talk about two years for uh, manufacturers, importers, and distributors of mixtures, they really don't have two years of duration of time to comply. They have the second year because they're, to the extent that they're depending on revisions coming in from manufacturers of substances that go into their mixtures, that may not come in until the end of the first year. And then, they're, then the manufacturer, importer, or distributor of a mixture, that's when their work begins. And it would and be a, imprudence right. to begin their work before they right. receive that updated information. And just as with HTS 212, there's a cascading effect for the right. people that are making the mixtures from the mixtures. They have to wait till the first round of mixtures is done before the second round can be addressed. And therefore, they're going to be out of compliance. Excellent assuming point, everybody Larry. takes the full time. And, and the same thing's going to happen with substances. So the, the time frame is totally inadequate, right. as it was last time. Okay, so let's wrap this up with what employers should do. I think it's important to start off by saying, I think employers need to work uh, with their organizations and with trade associations, industry groups, uh, and coalitions that you're participating in to make sure the comments get drafted and that these concerns are brought to the agency's attention. I think it's also important now because it's, are we at March 24th? And the comments are due on April 19th to consider seeking an enlargement of the comment period uh, so that more fully uh, fleshed out data can be prepared uh, in the comment process. And when you do so to request an informal public hearing, 
Uh, and I think when you do so, when you do prepare comments, it's important to discuss the impact of the proposed rule, uh, not just in terms of economic impact, but the mechanics of how a company would go about complying with the rule as proposed and the complications that the employer would encounter when trying to comply with the proposed rule as it's currently phrased and to, to, to determine how they would go about figuring out what's reasonably foreseeable in a chemical reaction, how that you would, as a manufacturer, or distributor, or importer, go about figuring out whether or not there are changes to the physical form after it's been released, uh, and, and all of the implications for uh, what threshold you would use for likelihood be a, of a chemical reaction, intended or unintended, so that you prevent your you don't have to identify a superfluous number of hazard classifications, uh, thereby burying the really significant or important information that you truly wanted to communicate to to your downstream uh, people who are handling your your product. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I would say are critical takeaway items for this OSHA thirty thirty. Uh, Larry, any other last thoughts before we move on? Yeah, we didn't have our time, but there's also a should language that you should consider impurities, which I assume some public interest groups or unions will push for a shell. And then basically, since everything's got something that makes it impure, you'll end up with uh, just about every substance potentially becoming treated like a mixture, at least to some extent. And people need to be thinking about what that would mean in the classification with process. With that yeah. said, don't forget, for those of you who are interested, once we turn off the record for the purpose of uh, publishing this OSHA 3030 as a podcast or as a YouTube video or on our website, uh, we'll turn off the recording and we'll just have an informal unrecorded chat about pre-submitted questions. So, so several people have submitted ahead of time some questions and we've selected three of them uh, for discussion in our off the record uh, section today. Uh, with that said, that's the last word, Larry. Thank you very much for, for joining the OSHA 3030. Uh, th this program will be republished uh, on YouTube. And uh, for several years, past episodes that have been republished as a podcast, please don't forget to subscribe uh, to the podcast and to the YouTube channel for Keller and Heckman. Uh, you can find our podcast on your favorite app, including Google, Stitcher, uh, the Apple Podcasts, Spotify, even iHeartRadio. And uh, our, we also have pages on LinkedIn. Every one of us individually has a LinkedIn page. Please link in with us if you haven't already. Uh, with that said, our next episode will be April 21st, 2021, always on a Wednesday, always at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and we, we may even put out a special episode. Of course, many of you have heard that OSHA is considering a, an emergency temporary standard for COVID-19 and was directed to consider issuing an emergency, emergency temporary standard by the White House. And so if that comes out early in the next 30 day interval, we may put out a special episode. And if it comes out later in the 30 day interval, that will probably be our topic for our next OSHA 3030. Uh, we also have sister programs here at Keller and Heckman, the Tosca 3030, which will be next April 7th, Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and we have a REACH 3030 and a FIFRA 3030 Stay tuned for announcements on the dates of those. Don't forget when you get invitations for any of these programs to share circulated around to at least three others responsible for compliance with these regulatory schema. Uh, with that said, thank you all for joining us on today's OSHA 3030. We look forward to seeing you next month. And until then, stay safe. <laughs>